Hi everybody, this is David and welcome to the week five fireside chat here for Educational Leadership 655, Pupil Services and Non-Discrimination. I am either being attacked by a python or else I have a very pesky cord here off the headset. All right, we are squared. We are in good shape. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, so a few things right off the bat. Um, I did post a Spragio video and also some companion documents. And I want to explain those before we get any further into this fireside chat. So I work through a contractual agreement with Sprigio um, Incorporated. And in that role, I serve as a user interface um, expert and designer, and then also work with Sprigio's clients um, and a number of capacities in, in more of a senior role with the company. Um, one of my roles that I do with the company is every month for some of the clients which pay for this service um, through the through the company, I produce a video which is about 15 to 20 minutes long. It's topic specific. And then um, there's a companion document that goes with that. And then there's also basically like a podcast that goes with it also. So what Joe Bruze, the CEO of Sprigio, has allowed me to do for this class is to share the companion document um, and then also the video, which I put out on YouTube. I will take the video down um, like May 1st because it is something that, again, is a item which is purchased by member districts. Um, and then the companion document, basically that is professional development. So you'll see that posted um under right under the video there's there's grooming there's two things one is a a a document one page that hector shared with links to different videos that he has done specific to child grooming plus other videos um related to child grooming including one which is, is seven minutes long very concise very very direct and then um in addition we have the sprigio document which is the professional document that i produce it's one page also and districts, some very significant districts, you know, 50 plus thousand students use that monthly for professional, part of their professional development related to people services. So I'm not trying to sell you anything. You don't have to tell your district, no, we have to go purchase Spriggy or anything like that. Um, but it was something, you know, I wanted to talk about grooming. I just wanted to bring some awareness to it. And this isn't anything, again, specifically like that falls under a mandated area where you have to give a, a um, presentation on grooming and, and, and things like that. But it is something that's becoming more frequent um, in school districts. And, and I'm, I'm seeing this in Sprigia was getting more requests for this. I personally get more requests to do work with, with grooming and grooming behaviors um, as far as professional development. So, you know, I wanted to put it out there. These are some incredible tools. You can use them any way you want. Um, I've been given that clearance by Sprigio. Um, so again, you know, it, it's those are resources that are available to you. Um, and I, I think this is something that, it, it, at least for an educational purpose, you have it. And if, the, if you want to take it a step further and use it for some professional development um, with your administrative team or whatever, go for it. But again, you know, it, it's just out there as a resource for this class. There is nothing um, specific like in the DPI saying that you have to do a, a mandated training on, you know, like childhood grooming or whatever. One of the points, um, you know, that Sprigio and I are trying to work on is to make the most universally um, accessible user input system for bullying, harassment, harm to self, harm to others, which means that we, it means that we want to create a system which will capture um, students who are either the direct um, recipients of grooming behavior or if they see their friends being the recipients of grooming behavior. It's very, very nuanced, as you'll pick up in the video and in the interview that I did with Hector. Um, so again, that, you know, you, that video is about 20 minutes long, very, very concise. Um, and it does have points in there. It has like questions. If you're a school counselor, here's some questions that you can ask that can maybe surface concerns about potential grooming. Very, very hard to identify. Actually, uh, Dottie Laster, who's an expert in um, chi uh, child grooming and, and human trafficking, is saying 
Uh, human trafficking, the case is reported about one out of 80 to 100, meaning, you know, less than less than 2%. And Hector goes through some reasons for that. But anyway, I put it out there. It's a resource. I'm not trying to sell you anything. Like I get no commission if all of a sudden, you know, Spragio, you know, I get notified that one of your districts or whatever has signed on to Spragio. No, nothing like that. But um, the CEO is is a great guy and he did make this available and you can use it any way you want. Like that paper document is yours. You can you can reproduce that. The video, though, will only be out on YouTube until May 1st, and then it'll come off. So, all right, enough with that. Um, Division of Labor, all right, Division of Labor for Bruce and your allergy um, team assignment. So (laughs) if you haven't figured out your Division of Labor, uh, the assignment is due February 18th, Sunday, February 18th. So uh, get on it. Get on it. Get it done. Take care of Bruce. I, so please, please go in and, and take care of that and communicate. There there are the threads where you can communicate with your team members, but you should be pretty far along at this point with this project. Um, you've had you know, nearly a month now where teams have been identified. Um, so again, that is do one person from your group and make sure a few things. One is whoever it is that um, submits it, just you know, one person from the group, put the group name and then like the members of the group and – if you can, like, don't use a lot of color in it, you know, <laughs> because I print these off and then I hand grade them. So if I end up, you know, wiping out a couple of my color cartridges, that makes me sad. So, you know, little color is fine, but, you know, I don't need big, you know, pictures of, you know, a, a big cover. And then here's a here's a picture of a Bruce or whatever like that. So, um, all right. Um, let's see. I'm going to get right into the module content for week five. And I've got it up over here on the left-hand side. All right, here we go. Dun, dun, dun. February 12th through February 18th. Um, we have the Alexandria, Virginia Schools People Services Program Evaluation. That is a document. Um, they put a, a request for a proposal, basically saying, we want um, an outside agency to come in and take a look at our People Services Program and, and basically evaluate it for us. Now, the all of your districts have the same type of process, but it's called the five-year DPI, Pupil Services Non-Discrimination Report, where basically you're doing this internally. And and not to this, this depth typically, but you're looking at like, you know, how many students with disabilities are in athletics, are in, in sports, um, opportunities available to students um, of different color, gender, how many clubs you have, um, you know, things like that. Anyway, you you can find it. All of your districts have them. They're all required. Um, I believe I might might have posted an example out there too. Um, But I like the Alexandria of Virginia model uh, because it has a nice mix of of what is, you know, quantitative and which would be numbers and stats and then also qualitative, qualitative or the interviews, the narrative. And I think when you do that, it really makes it rich. Uh, there are so many documents you you just get that um, you just get that that quantitative. You get the numbers. Um, so when you get the numbers, I, I I just think it doesn't tell the whole story. So this is this is kind of a cool way to to do things. Now again, most of your districts will probably never do this, and you'll never be asked to do this. But when you are doing your five year pupil non discrimination report. The DPI gives you some guidelines for that, but you have flexibility in how you put that together. So you might want to look at this document from Alexandria, Virginia, and take some snippets out of that when you assemble yours and say, here, I like what they did or like they, you know, how they interviewed some people and the way they put some groups together. It's up to you. But um, I think it's, it's a neat way to to talk about a pupil services program. Um, once in a while, you know, a school board will, will ask you for like a comprehensive evaluation. And usually, I mean, there's a timeline with that. And sometimes they'll say like, find somebody outside to do this. It doesn't happen a lot. But but again, that five-year report you're going to be asked to do by the DPI. Um, and when, I don't know, if there's a five-year rotating cycle, you find out from your, whoever's assigned to your district as your special education contact person. So um, we also have a link to the well we have the Sprigio best practices documents up there i put those up today today which is february 12th 2018 um we have some 
Um, I kind of jumbled things around a little bit here, but anyway, the DPI uh, web pages regarding English language learners. You know, I'm not, as I wrote in there, I'm not going to reproduce the wheel. DPI has done a really nice job with that, and you can go there to um, learn what you need to learn about um, ELL service requirements. Also, check with your local CISA, especially if you don't have a lot of English language learners. Your your local CISA um, can be very very helpful with that. And this is where something like Priscilla talked about the critical mass of determining um, do you need to like, kind of work through your CISA where they're coming in and help, you know, give, give you guidance and things like that. Or do you have like an, enough um, of a population where you're hiring your own like ELL consultant or whatever. And again, some people, you know, just have this assigned as, as part of their job duty too within the district. But um, the DPI, again, ELL page is, is really well done. They, they've, they've stepped it up with that, with that page. Um, we have we have homeless students resources um, that has again evolved much over the last um, ten years, and I'm going to get into the reflective teaching annotation. Um, it's, districts handle this in, in different ways. Uh, probably the biggest thing, if it does fall under your heading, is just you know remembering um, transportation is just something that you know you pretty much are required to do as a as a district if, if that student becomes homeless while they were you know living in your district and now live outside of the district um, I, I've, I've seen districts kind of um, spend a lot of time kind of debating that and whatever and really that's that's just that's just a what we call the Nike or the just do it or you know it, it just figure it out um, Usually there's somebody assigned, you know, to that, like you'll oversee it, but there's, there's usually like an administrative assistant or something who takes care of the actual, like setting up the transportation for the student, whether it be, you know, like paying a parent or, or a cab or something like that. But anyway, that stuff is pretty laid out. I mean, there'll be no surprises, but just check out the DPI page. Your CSA can, can be a help. Other districts that are, you know, working, uh, other other people who are working in the capacity of, like, um, the homeless um, student liaisons can help you. So, disproportionality. Um, so, I have information about disproportionality. Um, be aware of disproportionality um, because... Dun, 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 uh, yes, disproportionality resources. It's interesting because um, districts around Madison, for example, um, a number of districts have been identified disproportionate, meaning that the DPI has has said that you have um, a higher than acceptable number of, let's say, African American students identified with disabilities. Um, and what sometimes happens is that there is is a move-in population that comes out of maybe Madison Metro into some of the, the districts around, um, and then it, it does create a few students can create a substantial shift in a population. Um, and other times it um, so I mean that's that's one thing to identify, but other times I, I think one time I was I was we were over identified in um, like um, it. it um, as uh, Asian Pacific or Eskimo students with autism or something, R really, um, not to make, make light of it, but I think, you know, you, you got to understand where your trends are coming from, but, um, other districts have kind of, you know, perpetual data, which indicates that they are systemically identifying a certain group of students, um, you know, whether it be by, by race or by poverty, you know, socioeconomic level, um, as having dis disabilities or certain type of disabilities or suspensions or expulsions or whatever. And that all gets identified by the DPI. So districts have a, a process they have to go through to, to correct that, corrective measures. And if those figures don't change to what is acceptable by the DPI, the D DPI can actually um, force the district to reallocate some of its idea funding to address the matter, um, which which can be a substantial amount of, of money um, for districts. So just to be aware that there are districts out there um, and dispro disproportionality typically falls within the realm of special education. I believe there are about 35 districts in last year around the state um, that fell into that category. So here, here's the thing with, with disproportionality that you need to be aware of. 
Um, there are different approaches that districts can take to this. And one is obviously that you put a plan together to address disproportionality, uh, meaning you know that, that you power up your PBIS and really look at your, I, I guess, um, referral process and, and the interventions um, available to all students. But um, sometimes districts will say, or school boards will say, okay, this is it, like stop suspending students. And, and that's a way that, you know, of course, disproportionately goes away. It doesn't solve um, the core issues that, that were leading to disproportionality. Um, and another thing that happens is what's called an abeyance agreement. I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not, but you need to become aware of it. Abeyance, A-B-E-Y-A-N-C-E, abeyance agreement. And it's kind of like a familiar thing for, for lawyers to use, like school attorneys. I'm not a big fan of it myself. <laughs> so I'm just going to put that out there. Um, an abeyance agreement, basically, is, it, it, I guess some people call it like a pre-expulsion or whatever, but um, I have I have seen the data. I actually did a podcast on this, but I I, I took um, I took DPI data, took um, actual download it and analyzed it. Um, but anyway, um, an abeyance agreement is basically a a suspension that never goes into effect. It's saying you know we're not we're not going to put this suspension in effect unless like something else happens. Or parent, if you agree, we are going to go off site. Um, and we're going to do some education offsite, but we're going to do this through this uh, in agreement or like a change of placement in the IP. So nowhere in this is it going to be called a suspension, meaning we do not have to report it as a suspension. Okay. And you don't report abeyance agreements anywhere. They're not reported to the school board. They're not reported to the DPI. So they don't show up. So suddenly your data looks great when really what could be happening is you're just issuing abeyance agreements which are basically the same thing as suspensions, but you're using the IEP as a tool to change placement, or you're just using this abeyance agreement and, and getting the parent to sign off. Now, when I've seen these, I've seen these generated by attorneys. I've seen school attorneys generate these. And, and um, they, they sit down then with the parent and you know, with the school representative and basically say, here's your option. You, know, you can sign the abeyance agreement um, or we can go toward you know, suspension or possible kind of expulsion. Now this could be you could have different experiences with this. These are experiences I've had. I get contacted all across the country. I was contacted by a father in Pennsylvania two days ago about an abeyance agreement for his son, um, and you know he wanted to know more about it. And this is a very sharp guy, and his and his wife they they definitely knew what was going on with this. Um, and again, I'm I'm not a fan generally of an abeyance agreement. Um, in especially what's going to happen then again is, is it skews suspension data. Like suspension data in the state looks like it's going down. But if you talk to districts, they'll say it's not. that's really not the case. So, again, um, there's positionality involved here. I mean, let's face it. If you are if, – if you're sitting at a table and, and your school lawyer is next to you and the parent is across from you and, and you issue an abeyance agreement, you say, here, you can sign this abeyance agreement. It doesn't show up on the student record. It, it, uh, the student won't be suspended, but we will do basically the same thing we would have done if we would have suspended. Or you can go for the suspension, one or the other, or possibly before the board, you know, manifestation hearing and whatever, and then decide, you know, go before the board. But I, I feel like it, 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 it kind of gets real fuzzy with what due process is and parent rights and all of that. Um, it, and it, it, it uses the power of the district or the positionality of the district. Let's face it, when parents come into the district, the district is a large entity. There's a lot of power there. There's people with advanced degrees, especially once you bring a lawyer into this. Um, so again, I'm not for this. I've actually talked to some Congress folks in Wisconsin um, over the last few years with some of the legislation that was was being assembled regarding reporting suspensions and things, and, and we were talking about abeyance agreements. But just my thing, folks, if, if your district is doing a lot of abeyance agreements or not a lot of abeyance abeyance agreements or wherever you go, just kind of know the flavor of this and make your own piece with, with how you're going to work with this as a, as a director. Um, so uh, enough said on that. We have Professor Thunderclouds Resources. Uh, she is a very good friend. Um, I think, you know, and, and 
a lot of the things that I've posted that she has, schools have become very accustomed to discussions of race and equity. So like five years ago, those would have been new for districts. Now, you, you know, a lot of those things you probably have seen uh, already, but um, I, I think that can be, be helpful kind of discussion um, starters. So um, one of the things that Professor Thundercloud, so we had a recent conversation and she was saying, that in her work right now with with Native American you know tribes in Wisconsin is the the effort to try to preserve the heritage of the tribe, the passing on of the stories, the passing on of the culture. So she said that is really um, the big emphasis and and a, a huge concern of the elders of the tribe is is that you know the the kids right now aren't learning the customs and the culture of the tribe. And once they get to be adults, that's going to be lost. You know, they're, they're not going to carry on the, the traditions and they're, and they're not going to, to understand that culture. So it's a fine balance. She talked about, you know, when, you know, you're, you're talking about equity and, and, and then also um, understanding and preserving culture, you know, like the symbolism of the turtle and things like that. So, um, but uh, she she she's great. I really respect um, her work. So we have um, uh, week five uh, discussion question one: Plyler versus Doe. So in 1982, there was an attempt um, by a district to charge quote unquote illegal aliens a fee to have their child educated in a school. I believe it was a thousand dollars. So we you know we might see some of these types of discussions surface again. Um, with some of the city debates going on about like sanctuary cities. Um, so I just want you to be aware, you know, as, as director, some, this probably happens with school boards, um, especially new school boards sometime. Um, but you know, this is, you know, that this case did exist, the impact that it, that it had, it probably has more, again, if you have, if you're in a district that doesn't have a lot of English language learners and the population grows, and more resources are allocated into your English language learner population. Um, people might ask questions of like, you know, what what is our obligation um, in this regard? And then, you know, here's here obviously is a court case to to educate people and to go back um, to you know, and and again. I'm not saying people are, are, are going to say like, you know, we don't want to do this. We don't want to do this. But I mean, this this court case very clearly, you know, indicates that there are no, you know, additional fees you can put on to, um, you know, uh, uh, illegal aliens. I don't even like that term, but I mean, un undocumented students or just, you know, whatever it might be. I mean, you, you, you can't do that. You can't say, hey, you don't have a birth certificate. So, um, you know, you can't come to, to school here. So, um, and again, I think we've moved kind of, um, it, we become more familiar with this, where this isn't as fresh of a concept or new as it was even five or ten years ago. So, um, just wanted to, just wanted to put that out there because I think it's probably more of a cultural thing with a school board and a community um, that might be experiencing a, a, a change in its demographics. So, shout outs! I have some shout outs, Ellie. Um, you, you, you asked a, a great question. You kind of put me on the spot with this when you were saying, you know, you, you've covered a lot of things that are required, like, you know, nurses training, um, staff on type one, you know, diabetic management. Um, it could be, um, uh, mandatory reporting every year, you know, that needs to be done a, a presentation, um, and a competency, you know, check off on mandatory reporting. The DPI actually has it. You can watch a video online and then, you know, doc answer some some questions that go with that. Like suicide training, that's required, you know, one annually by the state. Now, there can be different ways that that's done. Um, you can, there are organizations which you can contact. One is, I, I believe they do QPR, but if you just type in like suicide prevention plus Wisconsin, you can find those or if you call your, you know, local CISA, and those are free and, um, you know, they'll come out and they'll do that. Um, also, bullying and harassment, non-discrimination, kind of like that PowerPoint that I showed. Um, that is required under Act 309 that you need to do that, um, you know, that you need to make staff aware and students and all that you, of what your um, process also is for reporting 
um, bullying and harassment, that all of that needs needs to be done. Um, so yeah, it does kind of get into, you know, there, there's a lot of things. So it's a prioritization and seeing what outside agencies might be able to come in. Um, it might be the fact of like the DPI training. Um, I know districts that just re- for, for like um, suspected abuse, um, that the mandatory, you know, reporting training that that was done on online they they during in service week or you know days or whatever it was at the start of the school year they had staff that was a requirement that they needed to go in and complete that and then um i they either had a sign off um i I don't know what the competency was on that if the district had something or they had to email a certain person at the district saying that i i've watched this this video so that was you know in the complete video and i i understand it and I know um, if I have any questions, I'll come to a counselor or something like that or administrator. So th- these are things you can kind of, I mean, I mean th- this is, these are the great discussions you have as a director when you're around a room with other directors <laughs> informally, you know, like when you, you meet once a month and, and you have kind of your, your director's meeting as you talk about start of the year because everybody has these things that they do. So you try to streamline it best that you can get your outside agencies. And, and I get where you're coming from, Ellie, because it's not like you have these full, for example, two days devoted just to student services because curriculum and, and you know instruction curriculum wants to get in there. You know, just overall technology wants to get in there. Hey, you know, we're using a different system this year. We have some different drive stuff, so we got to get people educated on that. So you have all of these different things competing for this time. But, you know, we, we kind of talked about the nursing. You know, nursing has their priorities that they, they need to get into, such as, like, you know, type 1 diabetic, you know, training and, and you know, students with seizure disorder. It could be administration of diastat, things like that. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's um, you know, there's also a requirement now in Wisconsin that all students um, participate in a CPR, AED class by the time that they graduate. So not, again, that you're directly involved. That's probably more of your, you know, curriculum and instruction person. But, you know, these are these are just things as, just to be aware of. Um, so, yeah, um, it, 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 get, it gets, it, Elliot, it's tough. It is, especially, you know, nonviolent crisis intervention training. Well, for seclusion and restraint, you're going to need some kind of, to be compliant with seclusion and restraint law, you're going to need to have some team trained in something that's either nonviolent crisis intervention, NVCI, or similar. So that's also some training that goes on, whether that happens at the start of the year, how often you want to retrain on that, you know, whether, it, you know, you get recertified in 12 months or 18 months or whatever. So all of these things and and who's responsible for them and, and you know, who's not. But, um, yeah, I mean, obviously – um, that's something you want to have down right away, seclusion and restraint, because I think it, I mean, there, there's a couple of districts right away at the start of the year in Wisconsin um, where I think two administrators um, were on channel three, <laughs> 3,000 or something, you know, here in Madison for, um, you know, some parents brought up some complaints about restraint of, of students. Um, so, but yeah, um, again, your directors will help. You can get help from your CISA, and, and things change. Like, you know, I, I, I kind of know, I mean, I know what things are now. Who knows what things will be at the start of the year if they'll get tweaked a little bit. But um, this is where you go as a director. And if you feel, you know, this is what you need to get done, you know, th- these are the priorities. These are like the must-dos. Like, we absolutely have to have staff trained on suicide prevention. You know, that is, that's a must we need to have to go through mandatory reporting, you know, whether that falls under you or, or somebody else, but, but you know, that, that it's there. And if it's under your hat, then, you know, that you notify your superintendent or whoever the person is in charge of professional development in your district. And, you know, say, this is what I have to do and put it down in writing. And, and th- these are the people I need. And this is the amount of time. And I need a check off, you know, list and, and all of that. So, if you're not getting that commitment then from those people, and you can even take this to the board, although like to try to do an end around the superintendent and stuff probably isn't going to, to um, you know, put you in good standing with the superintendent. You always have to ask, you know, work in the best interest of the child. Um, but, you know, you, you want to be in a system where you're you're all on the same page of trying to, um, you know, put your, your trainings um, aligned to requirements for making sure that that students are safe um, in the school setting. So 
I, I, I don't want to freak anybody out. You know, that's, that's the thing because it, it can feel overwhelming. I never probably felt personally that it was overwhelming because it does fall into place. And once you can put some of these things in and, and schedule in some time slots and especially if you can video things, um, it, it seemed like it all, it all worked out. Um, I did, I did work with a director in a fairly, you know, large district in Wisconsin. And that person was, um, not, not being provided, you know, the, the ample professional development time for these core things. Um, and did go to the superintendent and, and pointed that out, you know, like we, we have to do, you know, these, these, these things, I need time to, um, you know, train staff on, you know, uh, signs of, of suicide and suicide prevention. And, um, you know, was very direct in laying that out for the, the superintendent that protects you then. I mean, if it happens where, where you're trying, you know, you, you've indicated these things and you've asked for the time to do them and the district is slow to respond, if anything were to happen and hopefully nothing does, but you know, you, you can show that you you're working in the best interest as a student services director to have these things done and you've prioritized and you haven't been provided the resources then by the administrative side. I'm not trying to create like this, this rift between you and administration, but, um, but that is, that is something that then, you know, anybody probably looking at that from the outside, it's just, you know, the whole reasonable standard. It's like, well, you know, what this person is doing here as student services director is as much or more than any other student services director would do given the resources that they're provided. So it's a systemic thing. They made the board, they made, you know, they made the superintendent aware or, you know, whoever has the power to, to you know, work with the calendar or the board that these days are needed, the days weren't afforded. So, you know, they, they did what they could do in the time that was provided. So, yeah, it's a lot different than the old days. <laughs> so, but Ellie, uh, th- thanks for bringing that up. Um, and again, I think those are discussions that when you get around with other directors and say like, how are you doing this? Um, that can really, really uh, be beneficial, really be beneficial. And and sometimes, um, well, I mean, I had talked about it, I think, in, in the past, but doing some cohort trainings, um, you know, if it's suicide prevention to do like a very comprehensive training, you know, once every two, three years with staff and, and then to do like a smaller um, training, you know, in, in the meantime with that. So, but again, there are organizations out there, and I don't believe that they charge anything. And a, a very popular model is, is um, QPR. So um, question, I forget what the P is, and R is for, for refer. So Rachel, you wrote, um, I have seen many times that doctors prescribe school-based services. Yes, me too. Uh, does anyone know if that is actually in a doctor's medical jurisdiction? Um, it is not. No, the doctor cannot do that. Well, I mean, the doctor does that, but <laughs> the doctor can't do that. Legally, the doctor cannot write a prescription for special education services. Um, but it's very, very common. And it was very common when I worked in the Madison area. Very common. Um, so what can happen, though, is the doctor can write a referral, like through Child Find, saying um, that the child should be assessed in the school setting for what you know, whatever, SLD, autism, what, whatever would I, you know, be the area of concern. Um, but yeah, you'll, I, I, I have seen my number, uh, a number of, of, you know, orders from doctors of students, um, should be placed in, you know, learning disabilities services or, you know, whatever. And, and it's like, okay, you know, we, we will do our evaluation and then we will make a determination. Um, based upon that if the child needs special education or related services to um, receive educational benefits. So um, what happened a few years ago is the um, student services director at Sun Prairie um, worked on behalf of all of of the Dane County directors because this was happening a lot um, from all of the hospitals. And what happens is doctors, you know, parents come in and, and, you know, they, they either see, something on TV or somebody's uh, somebody else's, you know, child that they know has something and, and they, they kind of transpose those symptoms of, well, maybe, you know, my child has this, this, or this. Um, and I think there's this whole push to pathologize in the, in the country. 
I mean, um, I, I, I've just, I, I fully believe that, um, you know, the number of, of diagnoses, the um, American Psychiatric Association ICD-10 book is outrageously thick uh, versus, you know, just a few versions ago and what's coming out with the World Health Organization for what's being, you know, deemed um, an addiction or disability and things like that. So I, I do think we have this move to pathologize and people sometimes feel better. Um, but anyway, you know, knowing if, if something has, if, if you can label something, then it becomes more tangible. It's, 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 it, I, I don't know if it, it lends some credence to it. Like, I'm not just thinking like this is happening. Like the doctor did say, you know, this is what the doctor has identified medically for my child. So, um, anyway, that, that director from some prairie worked collaboratively with the other directors on a letter went to doctors, mass mailing, and it just said, please, like, you know, understand how the school system works. When you make a referral, um, we have to go through our process. You cannot qualify a student for special education services based upon anything that you write. It doesn't work that way. We will take it under consideration. Even like a medical order saying, like, the child doesn't have to arrive at school until 11 o'clock because of, you know, sleep apnea or whatever it is. These district has the right to determine what they want to do with that. They have to consider that, but they do not necessarily have to follow that. Now, I mean, if you get into things like, um, I, one was actually like that the student have preferential parking because they arrived to school late. It was kind of crazy. But I mean, if you have something obviously out there that is, you know, a medical diagnosis of type 1 diabetes or things like that, that's completely different. But um the other part is, you know, if it's not that big of a community and, and you have doctors who are frequently doing these type of referrals, you can contact them and try to explain this process. And I, this director, I believe, also went out and met with some of these doctors, um, was given some time by the hospital to meet with some doctors. It did help, although, like, I don't know how much it really helped because there's a lot of doctors, there's turnovers and turnover in doctors, a lot of parent pressure. You know, I think doctors spend, what, like seven minutes, you know, with a with a child um, or with a patient typically. So, you know, at, at least saying, you know, contact us, the school for a release of information, for some background information, data, we can, we can, we can track things. We can, we can look at certain behaviors and see if, you know, some things change that then, you know, before you jump into, to making this, because it puts us in a very difficult position because obviously the parent defaults to, you know, the, the doctor, of, of the doctor knows. And I've had that too. Like I've sat across the table and the parent says, well, the doctor wrote this and they know they're the doctor. So it, it is, it's a tough, it's a tough spot, Rachel, no doubt about it. Um, so those are some of the strategies that are used. I, maybe in a smaller community, they'd be a little more effective just because you wouldn't have that mass of doctors that you'd have to be um, trying to locate. So let's get into the week five um, teaching annotation. Let's try to make this one a little shorter because I do have that other video from Sprigio out there that I want you to be able to watch. So this in week five, we have non-school social workers, migrant and English language learners. So, um, you know, again, talked about that um, what, uh, Alexandria, Virginia student services document. And I, I like I like that. Um, I just like I, I like the way that that's done <laughs> again because it has the quantitative and the qualitative. Um, so you know, but um, it, it's I, I I put a question out here that's kind of interesting. If you ask people like if it, and I actually did this once, took like fourth grade teachers and said, what percentage? What, what's the average percentage of the school day that a student with a disability is included with non-disabled peers? And um, Everybody, everybody thought it was higher than what it what it really was. Once we took it and kind of broke it down into time that the student wasn't with with peers, so you know, and those indicators are out there. You can find them through the DPI or, or IEP. You, know, you can pull off minutes of therapy and the minutes in the school day and things like that. But I mean, there's some objective way to to get some information too about your your inclusive um, services um, and making sure people can identify what's inclusive, what's mainstreaming, what's the difference. So we t I talked about social workers, and this wasn't meant to be um, aggressive toward county social workers or private social workers, um, agency social workers, things like that. But what I wanted to point out in this, because I do hear this a lot, and, I, and I've read this already in some posts, um, is that, you know, 
when a social worker or an ombudsman, which is kind of rare, or a guardian ad litem or whatever it could be, um, comes into a school building, you know, they they need to um, there's you know operate under the school rules, meaning they check in. We know who they are, that they're showing identification, and and um, sometimes that. You know, if if a social worker is coming in, you know, through a, a abuse um, claim, you know, that someone has called in uh, suspected child abuse and they want to interview a child, you know, they'll. I've had I've had social workers who've said, no, I'm not going to give you the ID of who I am, you know, and 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 this information, um, and it's like, well. No, you are, you are because you know we're responsible for you in this building. We're not denying you access to the child. We're not you know um, supervising that visit or anything like that. I mean, you'll have your space. You'll you'll do that. And but um, but it was really it was a change in culture. Uh, so definitely you know that that took a little bit. But you know ultimately you are responsible. And you know in this day and age we need credentials. I mean we have a video right here on grooming. Um, but we need credentials of uh, knowing who people are. And then if there ever would be an issue where we would need to contact the greater agency, um, you know, uh, regarding that, that, you know, that interaction. So uh, it's something where I think, um, you know, just an awareness. Um, I talked about it where those types of things like building entry, who signs in and all of that, a lot of times buildings and grounds kind of takes control of that and leads that too in, in districts. So it's one of those things that you might have very little to do with, except just saying, you know, to buildings and grounds. And when they work with the front office staff of saying, Nope, you know, if somebody comes in, they need to show identification or give you, you know, business card and, and, you know, you give it back to them. Um, or if there's any, you know, any questions, if there's a number, you know, you call just to check because it's just this day and age. I mean, you, it is, it is just um, for the safety of that individual and for the safety of, of students uh, again, because, you know, what if, what if there's, you go into a lockdown situation or, um, you know, even, you know, there's some other emergency uh, situation that happens. So you need to be accountable for, or, or have a count of who's in your school. Um, so it how do what happens as far as like who invites outside social workers i think mostly in my experience that's been the parent except when the social worker is representing the student as like a guardian ad litem or an ombudsman those are kind of rare you i mean you can look those up um and in those cases you know i typically i mean i have either a legal decree or, or a release of information or things like that so it's it's it makes sense to bring releases of information to IEP meetings because frankly, um, some meetings you don't know who the parent is going to bring with them, and I want to make sure that you know that any information that is going to be shared at that meeting, um, I I have a release that I am sharing you know that that information with with that other party. So. Um, let me move on. Okay. On the second page, uh, I just put, you know, I, I talked a little bit more about, um, you know, so, uh, social workers, uh, especially so, uh, social workers coming in from the the outside and asking for, for information. Um, you know, I, there, you don't have any obligation to go through like a full interview with an outside social worker un, unless that's information that you're providing that is is deemed crucial to the best interest of that child. Um, meaning like if that social worker comes in and is asking you a whole bunch of information about the background of the child, I mean, there should be a release of, of information that's coming forward from that social worker. I mean, just like if a doctor came in and was asking you like for medical background of a, of a child or, you know, like a outside counselor or something like that, there would be a release of information for that. So, um, again, I have just seen this because these lines kind of get blurred a little bit and not to be a roadblock, but in the best interest always of, of students to make sure who is asking for that information and that they have a right to that, that information. Um, so, 
sometimes it, it just pays. I mean, I, I did a sit down once with the county and we just talked about what's the role of like, you know, the county social worker and then also some other county folks, human services and, and, and how we interface and, and what's your role, what's our role, where's parts when we're probably going to have some friction. And one was like on, um, I specifically rem- remember it was a fourth grade boy who um, r- r- had a number of, of very aggressive tendencies. So police were were called um, sometimes um, because of that. And we worked with the, the county. We had meetings at the county building. And it was, you know, what services could be provided from the county to this child because we were thinking maybe there needs to be even like a short-term placement somewhere. I think the parent, it was a father, was on, on board with that. But then the county was saying, no, this really should go through like the parent's insurance. We're not going to to do anything with it. So it was kind of this back and forth. And, and you know, we we were then trying to say, can we partner up with the county on some kind of dual programming or, or we pay for some stuff, the county pays for other stuff, I don't know. But, you know, those type of things like, you'll your superintendent <laughs> or whoever's working with you or your business manager will sit down and and you'll kind of hash it out saying here's ultimately what we want to get to and and here's kind of where we're, we're at with like where the the dollar side of that comes to so um anyway um oh <laughs> yeah I, I wrote the article um the right to select methodology it and i think that's a really well done article so um that I, I I would go back to that article a lot as a as a director um, because here here's here's an experience that I here's why I wrote the article here's the story behind the article so I'm a I'm a director at the time I write the article and uh, I get a call from one of my elementary special education teachers and and the teacher is pretty upset and says you know it's like the second week of school and and this is really interfering with tr- trying to educate the student when this outside provider is coming in, you know, like four hours a week or, you know, two afternoons for two hours and, and taking the student to a room and doing like this, this whatever type of therapy. Um, I'm having a really hard time with this and, and I don't think we should be allowing this. And I was like, what? I didn't, I had no idea this was going on. Um, the principal, so I immediately went over to the school. The principal thought it was, was approved by me. Um, so really didn't question it. This was a legitimate person. This was an actual provider of services, but this was a person that should have been providing services outside of the school. They were doing it during the school day, supplanting school services actually, um, because it was easier for them to do the services versus, you know, doing them after hours and at the parents' home and whatever. And there was, there was no way, like we, we, we had no idea who these people were. I mean, this person came in, but then there were other people that would kind of switch out different providers and they were doing this like, you know, unusual behavior plan. We had never been debriefed in any of this. And, and it was, these types of things do happen. And, and sometimes other districts would welcome folks like this in because they don't have the resources in their own district to cover this. So they would be like, oh, yeah, like you're an outside autism consultant. You work with whatever autism project or, you know, the parents insurance and and you want to work with a child here in school. That's great because now we didn't have those services or that takes those takes that off of our plate. So now you've got the child, you know, these one, two hours. Well, they're not educators. Okay. And they haven't gone through your approval process. And now you have people who aren't teachers who are in your building doing teaching, be, you know, behavior, carrying out behavior plans, which you haven't put together through your own functional behavioral assessment and behavior intervention plan. So I'm saying if that type of stuff does is happening in your district, just to be very, very aware of it. Because I do know districts sometimes do this because it is the way that they can get services. Um because again, maybe they're rural, maybe they don't have the fiscal resources, but oh my goodness, like, you know, please read the article and be very aware because I, I put an end to that service because it was supplanting, you know, we, we needed time for reading, we needed time for math. Um, this person was getting paid to see that, that child, they needed to move that, you know, to where they were working in the home. Um, they were, uh, you know, also liability, like they're going off into a room with a child um, not saying, you know, any type of grooming or anything like that, but again, you know, what if the child, um, there's a, there's a abuse claim child, you know, has marks or something like that 
and and now this te- this other person's involved and or this other person slips like they're there and and they fall is it a workman's comp now for you and again this whole thing of like you know what if, what if you have um a, a intruder situation and, and this person is in there and I mean, just there's so many there's so many red flags with that. But the article does a really nice job. Take a look at that. The right to select methodology, basically saying, when you have an IEP meeting, you know, someone cannot come in and say you have to use this reading program for my child or like an outside provider to say like this reading program. And like I said, I, th- I think I wrote in here like I, I've been in an IEP meeting where an outside provider actually re- wanted themselves written in to do four hours annually of training with staff. And then also that her books would be purchased by the district for this training. Wanted that written in the IEP. So um, just to be very aware, like that actually, actually happens. Um, And I wasn't the only district where that, you know, person tried to write themselves in the IEP and and tried to sell us, you know, a hundred copies of her, her book. Um, but there are many liability issues. Again, the article really lays it out well. Um, so let's get to the end here. Kind of talk about ELL services. And, and again, um, if you don't have a critical mass or you have questions, your CISAs are great resources for this. Um, and, you know, other other ideas visit long-standing programs like WASA, Lacrosse. Um, an example of a school district that needed to scale rapidly for ELL services was Arcadia. Not a very large district, but when Ashley Furniture expanded, um, a lot of their new workers were migrant families. So that's an example of meeting with them and saying, "How did you scale quickly if that is happening in your district?" And again, you are in a role of of being overseeing like ELL. Um, and the other part is, you know, a lot of these, these I don't know if it ha- would happen so much today, but a lot of these districts early on, you know, about 25, 30 years ago, I remember during my internship, the district I was with, which was a, a fairly, again, large district, they were just kind of figuring out like, do they have an ELL program? Do they have immersion services? They were still referring a lot of um, migrant learners for special education because they didn't know English. Um, and that, because they, they didn't, they were kind of figuring things out. I think, you know, it's much more settled today. Go with your CISAs, visit some districts, um, you know, that you'll, it's a great way to, to get information. Um, let's see. We talked again about payment of transportation costs. Just do it. It's a Nike. You don't, don't debate that. So, um, this one wraps up folks. Again, uh, please check out the Spragio video. It's 20 minutes long. You can use that as professional development. I'll keep it out there till May 1st. It's up to you. Um, but the documents, um, so Hector Solis, his documents to his, his podcast, his other resources, those are out there forever for you for free. They're very, very, very good. Um, and then I also have that one-page companion document, which Sprigio uses for professional development for staff. So in districts, so districts get this, and then it'd be like the principal would go through that with the staff in a building, and then document that went through that, and you know that would be then every every month. So it, it just is cumulative. So you have nine of those, you know, during a school year, or you know. 10 if we have one that we line up for August. Um, but so anyway, you know, that's something, and that's something you could do on your own to some extent too. You know, you could say, you know, here are some, some themes that I want to go through in my, you know, district. Again, not that this is all just like you, you were this, the sage, you know, the only, the only person, but, um, you know, we, we know that like, you know, you, you, you want to do something on food allergy probably like in October, right? Makes sense. You know, although food allergy month is what, April? <laughs> that doesn't make a lot of sense in schools. You know, I have it right at the end. Um, that you, you'd you want to do suicide prevention at the start of school year or something again, probably, you know, like right around January, you know, as a refresher. Um, that, you know, you need to, to, at the start of the school year, do your mandatory um, reporting. You know, if you wanted to... D- to do something, you know, that, that would, you know, be more into, um, 
you know, grooming or, or, you know, stuff like this. So like, again, what, what the document that you have from Spragio, that's part of a, a series. That's a, that's, that's an installment. That's the February installment that goes out. And actually the next installment going out in March is about suicidal ideation. And I've been working with some of the top experts on that. Actually, I'm working with a reporter um, from USA Today who has, who has done a number of articles, in-depth articles about um, completed suicides, interviewing parents, but then also districts and what districts have done afterwards um, throughout the country. And we've had some really good conversations. And it's interesting, too, because um, we, we don't totally see things um, eye to eye because I, I know how schools operate. And, and the USA Today person probably is looking more on here's schools who have, that have introduced surveys and more surveys to get information about students and whatever. And, and I said, okay, that's, that's good in that regard. But like, what else have they done? And is this making a difference? Because like surveys are, it can only tell you so much. And again, um, surveys aren't going to access all of your, your students because um, if your constructs and language aren't really developed well, meaning, you know, that your readability levels, maybe a sixth, seventh grade level, you're going to lose a lot of kids. Um, and you, you, you survey is one way. You can't ask questions about a survey typically and, you know, stuff like that. So it's, it only has so much, you know, so much worth to it. So that's where we kind of, you know, we weren't on the same page. But I'm working with um, with a school administrator in uh, New York, um, not New York City, but um, uh, one of the districts in New York. And we are talking tomorrow. And and the district is, is working to be proactive with um, uh, prevention of suicide and wants to, to – is working on a functional um, – definition of suicidal ideology of, of, of what they believe that that means, what their students are saying it means, what the staff is, is saying. So they're really progressive on this. So that's where I'm talking with them and I'm going to incorporate some of their material um, into my March Sprigio installment. So again, thank you for being active in this class. We do have uh, week six and week seven where you'll still have discussion questions and you'll be making your post. And then after that, you've got basically a, a month to work on your final paper. And just so you know, all of your SWATs have been returned. They were where you submitted them in, what was it, the week three, the upload. If you go back in there, um, on the left-hand side, it'll actually show like your paper. You'll like see it. It comes up as a kind of a PDF, a readable thing. But then if you just scroll down, it'll say like reviewed files and it's right there. Like you click it and it has my handwritten stuff on it. And then don't worry that on that page, there isn't a grade because I think it says like whatever, you know, out of 15, the grade shows up in the grade book. I went in and manually entered the grade in the grade book. So your grade is there. Everything is fine. It's just, it's a quirk of the way that that system is set up. Um, so yeah, all the grades, you know, your, your, your grades are in for that. Um, and I, I entered, I think everything through week three, um, and including the, um, including the SWAT. So nice job on the SWAT. Really fascinating, um, to find some of the nuanced things that, that you picked out of the SWAT. And the ultimate goal on the SWAT is if you can take, um, if you, if you can take, you know, like one or two weaknesses and move them over into either opportunities or, or, strengths like you know that's that's great like one or two um and also if you can um you know take take a threat and and you know mitigate that maybe one or two threats into like a weakness area so so meaning like you're, you're lessening your your threat exposure um but if not i mean at least you're aware of your threats the biggest thing though is like the the biggest thing is your opportunities. That's where it's like, our, you know, we have an opportunity to observe other schools' schedules and possibly adjust our schedules so we have more common planning time. And then that could lead to co-teaching and things like that. Well, it, wow, that's awesome. So, yeah, definitely go for that. Like, that's an opportunity, you bet, or an opportunity to use, um, you know, some peer mentors. We could do a peer mentor program, and, and that would be, you know, awesome to, to, to do this or whatever whatever so many of you came up with just outstanding ideas for that 
So thank you so much. Um, and again, continue to be active posters. Work on those uh, assignments for Bruce, your learning teams, and um, look forward to to getting those here at the end of uh, end of the week. So, um, yeah, and let's let's hope uh, <laughs> let's hope we are at the tail end of winter. You know, because what the groundhog and the shadow and all of that uh, what seemed like uh, quite a bit of snow here the last few days. All right, everybody, take care. <laughs>